Hello, everyone. I'm Paul Levengood, president of the George C. Marshall Foundation, and I'm here for another Marshall moment today with uh, our speaker this evening, Tom Bowers. Tom, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Paul. I'm honored to be here. I realize you made the drive down a little bit of snow. which no, we uh, did. We did. You're a hearty soul, and I appreciate that. Tell us a little bit about yourself as we get started and, and your background, and then we'll talk a little bit about how you came to your topic. Okay. Uh, I spent 35 years on the faculty of the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And I've always had an interest in history. My wife and I moved to the Leesburg area, actually Ashburn is where we live, uh, 10 years ago. And shortly after we moved, we took a tour of George Marshall's home, Dodona Manor in Leesburg. And I became interested in being a docent. And I started as a docent, I'm still a docent, but I've become much more involved in, in doing a lot of research, which has always been sort of a second passion of mine, mm -hmm. is research. Mm -hmm. So that's how I, I ended up in, in Leesburg at the Marshall House. Okay. And um, what attracted you about this particular facet of Marshall's life and career, his, his time as president of the American Red Cross? Well, uh, I've read many of the biography, biographies of Marshall, uh, including the four volumes of Pogue mm -hmm. uh, and many others. And the American Red Cross part of Marshall's life doesn't get much attention in any of those biographies. Now, there's probably a good reason for it, and I'm not arguing that it should have gotten more attention, but it just didn't. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of curious what really happened here uh, when Marshall was president of the Red Cross. And it gave me a chance, this is a selfish reason, to do historical research, to find original documents and do the research, which I really enjoy doing. So that's how I started, by looking at Volume 7 of Marshall's published papers, which covers the period of, of the Red Cross, and found some things in there. Uh, I went beyond that and uh, went to the Red Cross headquarters in Washington, D.C., got some materials. National Archives in College Park, Maryland, for the Red Cross archives. And uh, I looked at contemporary newspaper accounts from the period. And I spent two days right here in, in your magnificent library doing research with your archives about Marshall's time with the Red Cross. And I, at the time, my only goal was to learn more, possibly share that knowledge with my fellow docents. And I certainly never anticipated this event tonight. And I didn't anticipate that booklet that was uh, published with the help of, of the Red Cross. Right. And the booklet is called A Tonic for My Soul. A tonic to My Spirit. To My Spirit. I'm sorry. Right, right. I don't have it in front of me. But and that's uh, a statement that George Marshall made as he was finishing his time at the American Red Cross. He was talking to uh, some uh, the board, the Red Cross board, and that's what he said. And one of the things that I learned and concluded through all this research of the year or the 13 months he spent as president of the American Red Cross was, I think, George Marshall got more pleasure and personal satisfaction out of that job with the Red Cross than anything else he did. Interesting. Uh, you can see it in the comments he made. he made while he was doing it. The photographs you see of him while he's being Red Cross president and interacting with the public, he's got a smile on his face that you don't see in a lot of other pictures. So I, I really think it was a tonic to George Marshall's spirit. Well, certainly was a, a change of pace in some ways for him from, you know, Army Chief of Staff and kind of guiding this global war and Secretary of State trying very weighty issues trying to rebuild war-torn Europe. It must have been perhaps a, a bit of a, uh, a nice, you know. Well, as, as he said on more than one occasion, one of the attractions of that job was he was dealing with helping people. Uh, he was not dealing with war. Mm -hmm. He wasn't dealing, even when he was Secretary of State and dealing with all the, imp you know, the impact, the conditions that led to the Marshall Plan. Uh, those were all, he was dealing with tough issues uh, and destruction. And, and despair among people. And the Red Cross was, was a totally different thing for him. Uh, it was, they were, he was helping people. So let's set a little context. You know, I think most of us think of the Red Cross today and we think of, you know, 
a hurricane hits, the Red Cross is there to provide shelter and food and those sorts of things, or blood drives. That's really what we know of the Red Cross. Tell me a little bit about the Red Cross of the 1940s and 50s. Well, it was they were, the Red Cross was very much involved in, in World War II, okay. uh, and there were Red Cross there were Red Cross employees. They had paid employees, and I think there were also probably Red Cross volunteers, but especially. Uh, overseas, uh, where American soldiers were, uh, there was likely to be a Red Cross facility uh, providing, in some cases, it was like a canteen where they could go in and get maybe cigarettes and Cokes and, and so forth. Um, and so it was very important to them in that respect. Now, another thing that they did, that the Red Cross did, was um, if, a, if a sol- someone in a soldier's family died, let's say, in the United States, the family would go to the Red Cross and, and say, please contact so-and-so and tell him that his father died. And the Red Cross would not go to that individual. It would, the word would filter down to that soldier's commanding officer. And in some cases, that soldier would be allowed, if circumstances permitted, that soldier would be permitted to come home for the funeral and so forth because of the death in the family. Now, it didn't always happen. And in fact, that's one of the things, one of the things that Marshall had to deal with uh, when he was president was there were some holdover negative attitudes toward the Red Cross. I mean, it's hard for us to believe, I think, that, that people were critical of the Red Cross, but- For playing uh, that, for playing that role? For, for that. Soldiers said, look, the Red Cross wouldn't give me a leave. When my father. Oh, died. okay, okay. When in fact, it, the Red Cross didn't have that power. Uh, the Red Cross also provided emergency loans for soldiers. Somebody needed a few hundred dollars, the Red Cross would provide an interest free loan. Now, some soldiers complained I tried to get a loan and they wouldn't give it to me. And Marshall had to point out you know, we, we gave, I think, $47 million in loans. Uh, we didn't have enough to go around. And in some cases, somebody didn't get money. Uh, so there were those, that's what the Red Cross did. And in some cases, uh, as I've just explained, uh, it kind of got the Red Cross in, in trouble because it couldn't do everything that the soldiers wanted it to do. Sure. It was was that part of the attraction for the Red Cross of Marshall as a leader, as a maybe a helping build some of those bridges back to... Well, he, yes, he, had, he, he recognized the value of the Red Cross uh, through the morale of the soldiers. Uh, and he also, uh, the Red Cross had a lot to do with veterans after the war, provided a lot of services to veterans. And Marshall saw that, thought that was really important, not only what they did in the war for morale, but they also helped the morale dealing with veterans after the war. And he saw the value in that. So the Red Cross was a different organization than it is today. It was in wartime. It was in wartime, right. Uh, it still was doing the, the disaster relief kinds of things, and it did a lot of medical services uh, in communities. And uh, in some towns, of small towns, uh, a Red Cross chapter might be the only place to get any kind of medical assistance. So it was a bit of a surprise to me to, to learn that it came to Harry Truman to select Marshall as the Red Cross president. Is that still the case? Does the, yes, does yes. The, the, Ameri- the president the, of the United States right, still the, has that? The, the Red Cross Charter, which I think was created by Congress, uh, Congress provides some sup- monetary support, uh, but the Red Cross Charter says that the president of the Red Cross is appointed by the president of the United States. And that's another one of the things that, that uh, I learned in doing this that I had not realized before, and that is... Uh, Before Marshall retired from the Army in November of 1945, Truman had talked to him about the Red Cross presidency and basically said, I want you to be president of the American Red Cross. And Marshall's response was, there were two parts to his response. One, I can't do this until I talk it over with my wife. And the second part of the response was, I want a break. I can't do it right away. So Marshall had his retirement ceremony on November 26, 1945, at the Pentagon. Now, technically, it wasn't a retirement because he was a five-star officer, and he never really retired. Uh, 
But they had a ceremony for him on November 26th. The next day is when Truman called him. Marshall had gone to Leesburg. Truman called him the next day and said, I want you to go to China. Marshall, despite what he said about, I've got to talk it over with my wife and I want a break, he said, yes, I'll go right away. And he did. He went to China for a year, Secretary of State for two years, came back, and then Truman got back to him and said, what about the Red Cross? So that started in 1949. It seemed like he couldn't say no to President Truman. Truman said, asked him four times. Right. He finally said no in 1951 after he has served his year as Secretary of Defense, which is what he said he would do, one year. One year. Uh, Truman said, will you go back to the Red Cross? And Marshall said no. He finally, I guess he allowed Catherine to have a voice. And she apparently said, no, you can't do it. You've done enough. You've, You've done, done enough. enough. So four times Truman asked yeah. Marshall. So you've already spoken a little bit to maybe the mending a bit of the reputation of the Red Cross, but what were the main issues Marshall confronted when he took the president? And, and we should situate this, I guess, the dates of his time at the Red Cross. Were he became president uh, on October 1st, 1949, and uh, in September of 1950 is when he became Secretary of Defense. So for about two months, he was serving in both, although his focus was really on Secretary of Defense. Right, the Korean War. So it was from, the Red Cross was September uh, 1949 through the end of October 1950. Uh, and, well, one of the other problems he had was morale among the Red Cross workers. Uh, because of the structure, the Red Cross is kind of a two-layered organization. There's a national headquarters in Washington, which really directs everything. But then in, in towns all over the country, you know, there are thousands of Red Cross chapters and thousands of Red Cross volunteers. And the volunteers in those towns began to think, thought, that the national headquarters in Washington wasn't really paying much attention to it was a structural thing with the Red Cross. Uh, the Red Cross had what was called the Board of Incorporators. There were 65 individuals, I think they were mostly men, wealthy supporters of the Red Cross from the East Coast. And there was a central committee that really, the day-to-day -day sort of operations, 18 people. Six were appointed by the President of the United States. They considered it to be kind of an honorary appointment, so they didn't really participate. There were six members from local chapters around the country. They couldn't always come to Washington. So the six incorporators who were on the Central Committee pretty much dominated everything. And the feeling out in the field was, these people aren't listening to us. So he had that morale problem. And one of the things he adopted, this is it's interesting because when, when Truman asked Marshall to take the job, he said, this is going to be easy. You're not going to have to work very hard. And, and within three weeks after Marshall took office, he took off on a six-day trip, visited 15 cities. And I can't even remember the names. Of, it was, he started on, in Washington, went all the way to San Francisco, and came back. Uh, he was in an airplane. Uh, it was a, a Pan Am had converted a B-20 or something, a, a Martin airplane. Uh, and so Marshall took that long trip. Uh, and the reason he did that was he knew from his war experiences that if you've got a morale problem, the best thing to do is to show those people in the field that you care for them. And you go and you talk to them and you listen to them. And that's one of the things he emphasized was he said, I'm here to listen. He said, I'm not going to talk war. I've been talking war for 10 years. I'm tired of war. I want to talk Red Cross. So he listened to what people had to say. And later on, he took two other trips that were comparable to that. So he really, uh, despite what Truman had promised him, he really uh, had an exhaustive schedule because George Marshall couldn't do anything half the time. Right, right. So yeah. now, and, and these trips, you know, in, in, in the booklet, you, you sort of point to it. I mean, these he didn't just meet with local volunteers and leaders. I mean, he was addressing the public. Right, he was, right. you know, and we don't always think of Marshall in that way. You know, he's the man kind of behind the scenes. And here he was 
playing a very public... And we don't think of him as enjoying that kind of, of activity. Right. But it looks to me like what I read in the picture, as I said, in the pictures I saw, I think he was really enjoying it. And I think he, another reason probably for the trip was uh, he knew it would generate publicity. Mm -hmm. Because he did. Everywhere he went, the newspapers covered it. Sometimes there were parades and pictures. Uh, so the Red Cross got a lot of publicity out of his presidency. So would you say his presidency was successful for the Red Cross? It sounds like it was successful for him in that he enjoyed it and got something out of it. What about on the, the I think Red it Cross? was. Uh, and uh, there's a bust of Marshall at the Red Cross headquarters in Washington, D.C. Uh, the only other Red Cross leader who is honored with a bust is Clara Barton, the mm -hmm. founder of the Red Cross. So that shows you the Red Cross clearly. They clearly did. Clearly now, he, did. I think, he did enjoy it. When he finished, he said, there's still some things I wasn't able to accomplish. You know, we said, we still have monetary problems. We still have money to raise. Uh, there are still these negative attitudes. Um, but I still, I think he still enjoyed it very much. How was he as a fundraiser? Did they raise much money in his... Uh, in his they did. They raised about 67, close to $70 million in 1949, which is roughly $700 million in you know, today's dollars. He went on national radio programs. Uh, he appeared on Arthur Godfrey's program. He was on one radio program with President Truman. So he did what everything he thought that would raise money and would raise the profile of the American Red Cross. And do you think, was there a lasting impression from that year on the, uh, at the Red Cross, anything that you think um, kind of lingers to this day from Marshall's Well, tenure? I think the fact that they, they've honored him with a bust. And, uh, you know, when I was there, they made people made a point of showing me uh, the conference room where George Marshall sat while he was, you know, chairing meetings and so forth. So he is very much respected and honored at the American Red Cross. Well, I think it's wonderful that you've brought this, in some ways, hidden um, moment in Marshall's life to light, and I really appreciate you sharing it with us Thank here you. at the Marshall Foundation. Um, and I think, uh, I think we all learned something today. Well, thank you. I know I did. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. You're welcome.